13-year-old Jessie is chatting online with a new friend. Innocent enough to start with, the conversation soon turns. Rather than another teenage girl, Jesse's talking online with a predatory paedophile, looking for his next victim. But then Jesse isn't for real either. She's actually a middle-aged police officer at the centre of an elaborate sting operation. Okay, let's go. I'm Mark Williams Thomas. For 12 years I worked as a police officer, specialising in child protection. But things have changed radically since then. Now I've been given extraordinary access to the Metropolitan Police paedophile unit. The picture of the, uh, the erect penis, is that a photograph that you have taken? I've been able to see first-hand their covert internet operations and the lengths they have to go to to catch a paedophile. Here in this anonymous office block in West London are the men and women of Scotland Yard's paedophile unit. Officers at the forefront of the fight against internet predators. He's been sentenced to a further 27 months for trying to interact with teenage girls again. They are policing the web at a time when the threat faced by our children is greater than ever. The man in charge is Detective Chief Inspector Nick Stevens. How has the problem today changed in the way that you tackle paedophiles? In terms of child abuse on the internet, the problem is huge, it's significant, not just for policing in London, but across the UK and across the world. The fact yeah. is, if I had three times the amount of staff tackling child abuse on the internet, yeah. I would still be struggling to cope with the demand. If you go back to five, ten years ago, the numbers of child abuse images that we were seizing, we'd be talking about thousands. Today, we're talking very much in the millions. Over an 18-month period, I was given unprecedented access to Nick Stevens' unit, following key members of his team. I got your uh, email about Dark Angel. Do we know of any children in the, in the house? Or... Detective Sergeant Jason Tunn has been here two years. He joined after working on Scotland Yard's anti-corruption unit. All right, thanks, Finn. Cheers. Bye. 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 Detective Inspector Dave Manning also joined the unit two years ago after spending three years fighting gun crime in the capital. My name is Nick Duffield. I'm a DS on the Met Paedophile Unit. And Detective Sergeant Nick Duffield has been with the unit for five years. He joined the Met after 16 years with Hertfordshire Police. But my journey started with this man, John Taylor. He's a covert internet investigator, or CII. Since 2005, a team of CIIs at the Met have been posing as young girls on social networking sites to try and flush out predatory paedophiles. Without a doubt, there are girls, there are boys out there who have met people, and my take on it, they've been raped. It's not a question of just having um, um, a sexual experience at a very young age. They've been raped, they've been duped, they've been groomed. That's what's actually occurred. That's what social networking sites allow because they allow the anonymity of the predatory paedophile to meet young children and go on to chat elsewhere and groom. John told me how recently he'd gone online pretending to be a 13-year-old girl 
Jessie. A nine-year-old girl had started talking to him in a chat room. She'd asked Jessie if she'd had any sexual experiences. The nine-year-old said she knew a man called Andy who could teach Jessie all about sex. Two weeks later, Andy came online. The conversation immediately turned sexual. He said he wanted to take Jessie's virginity. Police investigations have revealed that the nine-year-old girl doesn't exist and that Jesse, in reality John Taylor, has been talking with a sophisticated groomer. His name is Andrew Linton, a 55-year-old with no previous convictions. It's Friday afternoon and Linton's planned meeting with Jesse is just 72 hours away. We've been exchanging emails. I received the one today that he wants to meet on Monday at um, 11.30 at the park. Um, I want to get back on to him in, with an email to say how glad I am. Looking forward to Monday for the meet. But we also want to get a bit more information about him. We know who he is, but what we want to do is make sure we're in control of it, i.e., how are you travelling? How am I going to know it's you? So we just want to be safe and secure and control this meet rather than Andy Linton con controlling it. On a Friday afternoon, John Taylor, posing as 13-year-old Jesse, asks Linton what he'll be wearing for the date. Linton thinks Jesse's mum will be at work on Monday and she'll have the house to herself. It's Monday morning and John's colleague, DS Jason Tun, asked me to join him as a team of undercover officers made their way to the planned meeting place. So we've received an email at ten past six this morning from uh, Andrew Linton, who's basically confirmed the meeting and said that he will be there for as close to 11.30. Let's give us a description of what he's going to be wearing so that we'll, we'll know it's him. And what do you know about Andrew Linton? We know that Andrew Linton is a man in his 50s. He's um, a married man. He lives in Hertfordshire. But obviously we don't know what, uh, what he does for a living. He tells us you know, that he's a scientist um, and that he also works in IT. But we don't know a great deal about him. Um, he's not known for, for any criminal offences. Um, so at the moment, you know, he's a bit of a blank canvas, really. What does he think is going to happen when he turns up today? He thinks today that uh, what, what he's specifically asked is whether our, our parents are out for the day and whether or not we can meet uh, in the park and then um, go back to the house of the, the undercover officer so that he can, uh, he can basically have penetrative sexual uh, activity with us. So we expect that he will turn up with some sort of problems or something like that. I mean, that's really worrying, isn't it? It is. He's, uh, you know... Uh, he's clearly a dangerous person. I mean, the, the fact that he's, you know, he's now using you know, a number of identities, you know, in order to to orchestrate what is quite a, uh, a, a cunning grooming process shows how dangerous the man is. Linton has sent a description of what he's wearing to what he thinks is a 13-year-old girl. His planned meeting place, a busy South London park with a kids' playground. We arrive an hour early, and other officers are already in place. As we wait, Jason Tun spots our man. From Jason, all units be aware, we have a potential subject. All units wait. This is our first sight of Linton. In a matter of seconds, he will discover Jesse doesn't exist, and he's at the centre of an elaborate police sting operation. South London, police officers lay in wait for a predatory paedophile. A man has been grooming what he thinks is a 13-year-old girl for sex. In reality, his conversations have been with an undercover officer. Now he has arrived at a bustling park, hoping to meet his victim.
All units confirm this is the subject. Um, I'm here on the day out. Are you? Hey. Hello. What sort of house have you come from? Um, Hertfordshire. Um, now, do you want to tell me what you're really doing here? You've not come on a day out, have you? You know that we're here because we know what you're here for. Understand me? So why are you here? Um, I arranged to meet someone. And who did you arrange to meet? A girl called Jessie. Is that where you want me to stay? Okay. You're going to be arrested, OK? It's attempting to meet a girl following sexual grooming. Okay? Can you actually tell me what happened? What happened? How do you mean? Well, was the girl I was talking to a sting? That will be something we will go into later on, OK? OK. The detectives discover condoms in his pockets. Stick them in the, uh, stick them in the vulva. Yeah. I make my way to Charing Cross Police Station to meet officers taking Andrew Linton into custody. This gentleman has been arrested by me at five past eleven this morning uh -huh. for the offence of attempting to meet a girl following sexual grooming. Are you in some way being arrested? Yes. Okay, I'm going to authorise your detention here so that this officer can investigate the allegation made against you by questioning or by other means. You understand? Yes. Yeah, do you want anybody informed that you're here? Um, I, I understand my wife will be informed as a course of the investigation. Yeah, we're going to be doing a section 18 yes. search if, if granted, so what we intend to do is inform his wife once we get to the house. Okay, well, so then, no one else. Yeah, well, we will we'll, we'll ask this officer to search you now, okay? So if you... Uh, Have you concealing anything on you? From my own experience working as a detective, I know that this is when the real work begins. If you're going to investigate these people and investigate them properly, which it needs to be done, you know, because these are serious offences, it is a lot of work. You know, the, the easy bit really at the end of the day is, is getting to the point where you arrest these people. It's when the arrest happens, that's when the work starts. You know, you've got to prepare the case file, you've got to get the telephones examined, you get the computers examined. You've got to look at all the images. You've got to see what other offenders are on, already on that computer. If there's other victims, you're looking at a, a whole separate investigation. Um, and if you multiply that by the amount of prisoners that are on that we that we deal with on this unit, then you're talking about a phenomenal amount of work. At this stage, police have no idea how serious an offender Andrew Linton could be. Would you have actually gone back to a child's house today? That would have been up to her. If she said it was OK, would you have gone? Um, yes. I'm going to put it to you, Andy, that you have manipulated this whole scenario very cunningly in order to groom a 13-year-old child on the internet so that you can find out exactly what is going on in that child's head and that you are in total control of that situation from the beginning right through to the end. Do you accept that you've been manipulative? Uh, I accept that the evidence looks that way and I accept that there is a degree but um, uh, it was much more of a roller coaster ride going along with the fantasy. I really, I really didn't feel that I was just manipulating this girl. It just, it just happened. But you say, it, but you say it's a fantasy, Andy. But fantasy is not <coughs> stepping out of your front door, turning up in London with three condoms in your pocket. I know. Is it? No, it isn't. You As the interview know. continues, Physical other officers are making their way to Linton's home fantasy. to seize his computer. Can you tell me how many images you have at home and what they are? I'm not talking adult pornography, I'm talking pornography involving children. Um, 
pictures of girls that I, I, I've been sent, um, lots. I couldn't put a number to it. Mm -hmm. But, um, uh, no, I couldn't put a number to it. Okay. Actual um, videos of, uh, of acts with children, um, I don't know, a couple of dozen. Okay. Do any of the videos involve very young children, or is that just still images that you're talking about? Um, I think there's one that involves a baby, which isn't, isn't very nice. I would later discover that Linton's offending was far more serious than it first seemed. But for many, Linton appears to be the epitome of middle-class respectability. I'd learned the married IT professional was even Oxford educated. Not the image most of us have of a paedophile. Back at the office, I caught up with Detective Chief Inspector Nick Stevens to find out more about the type of men his officers have arrested since these covert operations began. There is this perception, this stereotypical image of the paedophile, you know, the man wearing the, the coat, but that's not the reality, is it? No, certainly the internet has shown, and the people that are arrested have shown, that people who are committing offences, the paedophiles, the sex offenders, can come from any walk of life. Certainly over the last couple of years we've arrested magistrates, lawyers, company directors, police officers, people who are working within the media, along with the type of individual that you've just uh, spoken about, the unemployed man, the 40-year-old single male still living with, with mum and dad. It can be literally anybody who is committing sexual offences against children. Increasingly, Nick Stevens' team are relying on cutting-edge technology to both trace the victims of abuse and to help identify offenders. Recently, officers from the unit have discovered indecent images at the home of a Kent businessman, Dean Hardy. Some of the images seized show a man's hand abusing a young girl. They believe that man is 50-year-old Hardy. But building the case against him rests on using groundbreaking forensic techniques. Last September, we executed a search warrant at his home address. DS Nick Duffield is leading the investigation. All you could see in the photograph um, was the hands of the abuser. So what we then did was we sought authority to photograph his hands. Um, we then took that photograph with the photograph from the image we'd recovered uh, and we went to seek out an expert in relation to hand identification or, or marks, uh, blemishes on hands that uh, could be compared with the offender's hands. Nick Duffield believes the photos were taken when Hardy, a furniture salesman, visited Thailand in 2004. But proving it's his hand in the photos abusing a young Asian girl rests on expert evidence. This is a picture of the hand that was touching the girl's genitalia. In the background there's a number of photographs. A member of the team talks through the case with Crown Prosecution lawyer Arwell Jones. And you can see this image here. It's a picture of a, uh, a young Could girl. the hand evidence help secure a conviction? It's a picture of a naked Southeast Asian female. It's difficult to say the age um, mm. because it's only a shot of, of there's, no, there's no facial shot there. But what it does clearly show is an adult male hand touching the genitalia of this young girl. Right. And here, as I go through the slides, the picture on the right marked with an S is Mr. Hardy's hand, right. and that's the photograph we took of his hands when he gave us his consent. Mm. She's highlighted three points here, which are identical on those hands. And it's effectively the, the pigmentation and the marking 
of the scarring. That's right, yeah, she's identified a scar on. on the left index finger as well of the offender's hand. Right. And, and as you can see, like you say, the pigmentation and freckling is, uh, is identical. Mm. OK, I'm going to need to uh, take this report away and read it in some detail. Sure. But certainly, uh, on the face of it, it seems an interesting, yeah. an unusual source of evidence, but maybe a, a compelling source of evidence. My preliminary view at this stage would be that this case really does hinge on this expert evidence. It's clear the lengths police will go to to secure a conviction. But will this new hand recognition technology be enough to convict Hardy? This type of expert evidence is new territory. If this case is successful, it could be a useful tool in other paedophile cases, not just within the Met, but for forces around the world. Meanwhile, elsewhere in the unit, the covert internet investigations are continuing. John Taylor is online, posing as Becky, a 13-year-old schoolgirl. He's been talking with a man called Andrew Smith. Some paedophiles spend months carefully grooming victims. Others, like Smith, are blatant from the start. He quickly suggests a meeting with Becky. In later online chats, he goes still further. Finally, after three months, he sends what he thinks is a 13-year-old girl a webcam picture of himself masturbating. Nick Dufford asked me to join him in South London. He told me Smith was on his way to meet Becky. His team are in position in a nearby cafe. Andrew Smith doesn't know it yet, but he's about to walk straight into an elaborate police trap. Nick Duffield and his team are in position outside a cafe on a busy South London road. They're about to arrest a predatory paedophile who's expecting to meet a 13-year-old girl for sex. Nick Duffield asks us to hang back until his team have secured their target. He can't take any chances that the man, Andrew Smith, spots us and flees. Finally, at 3 o'clock on a Thursday afternoon, Officers move in for an arrest. Can you call a car up for us, please? This is Andrew Smith, a London businessman who sent images of himself masturbating to what he thought was a 13-year-old girl. At London's Charing Cross Police Station, Smith is initially held in a waiting area before being taken into a custody suite. Mr. Smith has been um, engaging in uh, internet chats uh, since about February time to what he believed to be a 13-year-old girl. On the 25th of um, May, he um, masturbated to um, his webcam, intending, believing it to be viewed by the 13-year-old um, girl. And at five minutes past three this afternoon, I myself arrested him for attempting to meet a girl under the age of 16 following sexual grooming and also for the defence of attempting to cause a child age 13 to view a sexual act. Well, I'm going to authorise your detention here so this matter can be fully investigated. Later, in police interviews, Andrew Smith initially said he had no intention of having sex with Becky. I travelled there today to have a coffee with Becky and basically to tell her not to meet people off the internet because she seemed like a nice girl. Um, I'd absolutely no intention of doing anything whatsoever with her. 
but yeah, obviously I said some things I, I, I shouldn't have. Is that all, all that took place? Um, yeah, I did masturbate on, on the cam once. Why did you do that? Just, just for a sort of laugh, I mean, didn't, obviously didn't mean to defend her or anything like that. Two months later, I caught up with Nick Duffield to discuss the Andrew Smith case. At his work address, we found um, this cigarette packet, um, and in there, I don't know if you can um, you can see, but there's a there's a digital camera, um, and within that cigarette packet, he's made uh, holes in there, which um, allowed him to take pictures, um, unbeknown to um, the person he was photographing. Um, and on his computer, we found a series of images that had been taken on the underground. So, um, all, albeit these weren't of children, these were of um, adult females, but quite clearly a deviant act which um, needed further investigation. Andrew Smith pleaded guilty to attempting to meet a child following sexual grooming and inciting a child to watch sexual acts over the internet. No further action was taken over the photographs. He was jailed for a year and will be on the sex offenders register for 10 years. But after serving just six months of his sentence, Smith was released for good behaviour. Six months for travelling to meet someone that effectively he would have raped, it seems to me to be absolutely not in line with what the person should have got. Well, that is a, that's a matter for the courts. It's not for me to comment on that. Um, the judge has his guidelines. He has to take into account um, early guilty pleas. Um, he has to take into account that this, this guy is previously good character. Um, but it's a matter for the sentencing judge. Smith is clearly a dangerous internet predator. But I wonder how many more men like him are trawling the net to meet teenage girls for sex. We're watching people coming to meet who they think are young children. How many times do they meet real young children that aren't undercover officers? The honest answer when we're talking about <laughs> groomers, when we're talking about paedophiles, sex offenders who are actively committing direct offences against children, there's nobody anywhere in the world in law enforcement who can give an honest answer in relation to the figures. I can sit here and say that in relation to people who are downloading images, distributing images, we're talking about tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of individuals within the UK. But the people who are committing the most serious offences, those who are in networks, I cannot say and give any sort of answer in relation to how many are committing those offences. And that has to be extremely concerning in itself. The Met's covert internet investigations generate almost three quarters of the work carried out by the unit. Social networking sites and internet service providers are already working with the government to try and keep children safe. Given the apparent explosion in the number of paedophiles online, I wonder if the internet is actually responsible for a growth in offending. Where there are children, there will be people looking to exploit them, so we have to take precautions to reduce that risk. We don't simply have to worry about the sex offenders. We have to be home. I joined other parents at an internet safety seminar. They want to know how to keep their children safe when they're online. Realistic about it. The law in this land says... The man leading the seminar is Donald Finlater, head of Stop It Now, a campaign set up to help offenders and their victims. I think the internet brings so many kind of positives to our lives and to the lives of children, uh, and of course there's no turning back the clock, and I wouldn't wish to, but it also brings lots of dangers with it and lots of opportunities that people are seizing. I genuinely believe that, yes, there are thousands and thousands of people in the UK who have chosen to look and who probably today are still choosing to look at or for child pornography. So, some of those people will also be looking to make contact with children through that technology and will be doing that with, with a view to physically getting in touch with children and potentially even sexually abusing them. In the pre-internet days, rather a lot of those people would not have thought to do some of those things. It wouldn't have occurred to them, the opportunity wouldn't have been there. So whilst I, I don't want to blame the internet, it, it's opened, opened a door really and said these things are becoming possible.
I received a call from Detective Sergeant Nick Duffield. He told me he had some good news. Remember Dean Hardy? The man they believed had photographed himself abusing a young girl in Thailand? When faced with the full weight of evidence against him, including the hand identification work, he changed his plea to guilty. I caught up with Nick Duffield at Southern Crown Court as Hardy was sentenced. Initially, Hardy had uh, made a no-comment interview. He'd, he'd, he'd uh, opted not to cooperate with us. However, when he was confronted with that evidence, he admitted that he had been there. He'd certainly been in the room when those photographs were taken. Uh, and he was in two minds. He couldn't decide whether to admit to us that, yes, that was his hand. I think he wanted to wait to see if the Crown Prosecution Service were going to support um, the evidence that we had and charge him with these offences. Uh, and I think it shows that... Um, we will stop at no opportunity to identify individuals that seek to abuse, sexually abuse children, whether it's in this country or whether it's abroad. Hardy confessed to two charges of indecent assault on girls under the age of 14 and a string of child abuse charges. He was sentenced to six years in jail and will be on the sex offenders register for life. Back in the unit, covert internet investigators have been contacted by someone calling himself Dave. He says he's 27. He thinks he's talking to a 14-year-old girl called Shelley. In later conversations, he's even more explicit. told Shelley he wants to meet her, but he's nervous. Investigations have revealed the man calling himself Dave is in fact David Corcoran, a man with a previous conviction for downloading indecent images of children. He has agreed to meet Shelley at one of London's busiest railway stations. I joined DI Dave Manning as officers made their way to the meeting point. Yeah, Jason, we'll see you tomorrow, Dave. For some time now he's talked about travelling, but he hasn't travelled, has he, up until today for some reason? He intimated recently that um, he, he wanted to travel, but he was concerned that we may not be who we say we are, um, that you know, police do investigations on the internet and there's, there's some sort of trap. Yesterday we managed to reassure him that we were who um, we say we are. Within a very short period of time after that, he'd, um, he sent us a, a picture via the internet of this erect penis and said, Greg, looking forward to tomorrow. Um, he's brought forward his um, travel time as the earliest possible train he could get to travel to London. Um, he's on that train now, um, due in at Euston in about an hour and a quarter's time. Corcoran doesn't know it, but undercover officers from the Lancashire Force are on the train with him. Police can't take the risk that he assaults a real girl as he makes his way to London to meet Shelley. But at Euston, there's a problem. The train's been delayed until 12.26 now as an estimated time arrival, so that's five minutes' time. Um, we know he's still on the train. He's been sending us messages over the last hour, hour and a okay. half for a, a graphic nature, asking us what we're wearing under our skirt, that sort of thing, you know. So he's clearly still teed up from the, the, the uh, sexual angle, so... Jess, just left Watford Junction. But at the very last minute, there's a change of plan. What now? This one. Platform 13. The train will arrive at a different platform, at the opposite end of the station.
There are just minutes to go until the train arrives. Detective Inspector Dave Manning and his team are at London's Euston Station. That's all right, it's not in yet. Predatory paedophile David Corcoran is due to arrive in minutes to meet who he thinks is a 14-year-old girl called Shelley. So, Dave, we've just had to quickly move from the other platform where we thought the train was coming in at. It's now coming in at platform 13. What's he wearing? What's the latest? Um, well, he's wearing, he's wearing a brown khaki jacket, blue shirt, uh, blue jeans and brown shoes. It's curly hair um, and, it's, and glasses as well, as you've seen from the picture of him. But uh, the picture we've got of him appears to be his hair's cut shorter than it is at the moment. But otherwise, it, it's a uh, good likeness. The train arrives over an hour late. Corcoran doesn't know it, but he has undercover officers following him along the platform. Jason Tun and DC Caroline Bartle get ready for the arrest. Is that you? I'm not sure which one he is. Oh, yeah, yeah, I've got him, I've got him. David Corcoran. Yes, I'm DC Bart from the paedophile unit of Scotland Yard. Okay, what are you here for? I've got some coffee. Pardon? Coffee. Coffee. I changed my mind. I said I shouldn't be doing it. I said it takes to say such a thing. Right, OK, I'm arresting you for attempting to cause a child to watch a sexual act. I'm not doing it. Just listen to this officer. Inciting a child to engage in sexual activity and travelling to meet a child following sexual grooming. You don't have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you do not mention when questioned something which you later rely on in court. Anything you do say may be given in evidence. Do you understand? Do you have any knives on you? Any syringes, no, no, needles, no, any sharp no. instruments? Jason carries out a quick body search on Corcoran checking for both dangerous items and any evidence. Okay, okay. let's go. Okay. All right. He's led away by police officers through the crowds at Euston Station. Finally, David Corcoran is driven off to Charing Cross Police Station. Okay, can I take your surname, please? It's Corcoran. Right, can I get someone to give him a quick search, yeah. please? <coughs> Jason carries out a more detailed search. Two sealed condoms are found in Corcoran's wallet. You are nearly 28 years old, so a child half your age. Why are you sending her that type of photograph? No During police interview, Corcoran refused to speak as the allegations were read out to him. That your pattern of offending, your sexual offending pattern, has got worse. Would you agree to that or not? No comment. Because having gone from looking at things on the internet downloading child pornography from the internet is one thing. Travelling half the length of the country in order to have sex with a child is a completely different thing. Do you not agree to that? 
I'd agree to what you said. Okay. Well, I'll ask you to look at that there. Okay. Mm -hmm. It says image 0707208.jpg. Yes? Okay. That's what it says. That's what it says. Okay, lovely. Is that a photograph that you have taken with your mobile telephone? No problem. Okay. <coughs> Later at court, David Corcoran pleaded guilty to attempting to meet a child following sexual grooming, inciting a child to watch sexual acts over the internet, and inciting a child to commit sexual activity. He was jailed for two years and will be on the sex offenders register for ten. It seems clear to me that had Corcoran met a real 14-year-old girl at Euston Station that day, the girl would have been at serious risk. Can you ask me to ring Jason Tum from the paedophile unit? It's just in relation, she wanted some assistance around um, some images that she recovered the other week. So she Members of the unit are dealing with offenders like Corcoran day in, day out. I wanted to know what advice they would give to parents. Nick, a key element of safeguarding children has to be education. Mm -hmm. And education very much coming from parents. What would you say to parents, some of those top tips, mm. advice you would give them? Um, talk, to, talk to your children about the dangers of being on the internet. Share with them press cuttings, show them TV programmes. Let's not hide away from the fact that there are individuals out there that are prepared to sexually abuse children via the internet. Secondly, have your home computer or whichever computer it is that's accessing the internet in a public area, if you like, in an area um, where the parents, older brothers and sisters are going to walk past. Say to your child, I'm not going to monitor you, but be prepared for me just to walk up occasionally and say, tell me who that individual is that you're talking to. And if you can't, then there's going to be some, um, some fallout from that. The full horror of the threat posed by internet predators was about to be brought home to me. Detective Sergeant Jason Tun told me he had an update on another case. Remember Andrew Linton, the IT professional from Hertfordshire? who had wanted to meet 13-year-old Jesse in a London park. After examining his computers, police discovered almost 20,000 indecent images of children. They also found video clips of a man abusing a 17-month-old baby. The man in the video clips was Andrew Linton. When we searched his house, obviously apart from recovering the indecent images, we also found that there were nappies, children's nappies, that were actually in the house. And when the officers looked at those, we'd noticed that they were actually opened. And when we spoke to Mr Linton about them, he told us that he was, uh, he was interested in uh, the wearing of nappies and nappy technologies. He felt it helped him connect to being um, towards a younger child. So obviously that was a great concern to us. Um, but more worryingly, really, and it's something that the judge commented upon today, was the 600 or so story files that we found on Mr Linton's computer. And I've read some of those, those, um, those logs, and they are... Uh, horrendous, uh, to be honest. The, the ones that were highlighted to the court uh, graphically illustrate and show how uh, fantasy stories that are downloaded from the internet by Mr Linton and other people like him, and the ones that Mr Linton had depicted the rape and eventual murder of a four-year-old child by her father. We've shown that Mr Linton's sexual interest in children has, has spanned the last decade and he's operated on the internet with complete anonymity until now. It was only really through our deployment of our covert internet investigator on this, on this particular police operation that we came across Mr Linton. Had we not done that type of operation then it's, it's highly likely that Mr Linton would still be out there uh, operating on the internet distributing you know, horrific images of children being abused with other paedophiles. Linton pleaded guilty to the indecent assault on the baby and 30 other charges, including his attempt to meet a child following sexual grooming. He was jailed indefinitely and will be on the sex offenders register for life. During my time with the paedophile unit, I've discovered just how vital their covert operations are. I mean, it says it's having got more people coming in, it goes on and on. The vast majority of the predators caught in these stings like Andrew Linton have no previous convictions and weren't known to the police.
But I was about to discover that these weren't the only covert internet operations run by the unit. Coming up next week, DI Dave Manning is on the trail of a family man who's been trying to procure a 12-year-old girl for sex. We follow detectives to Europe as they investigate a criminal gang peddling child porn on the net. And the covert internet arrests continue. For the past 18 months, our cameras have had exclusive access to the Metropolitan Police paedophile unit. We've seen officers going online, posing as teenage girls to flush out predators trying to groom children for sex. We've witnessed men from all walks of life being caught in these internet sting operations. Bye folks, wanna go the way please, thank you. And discovered the full horror of their offending. You've got fancy is not stepping out of your front door, turning up in London with three condoms in your pocket. Is it? No, it isn't. I'm Mark Williams Thomas. For 12 years I worked as a police officer, specialising in child protection. But things have changed radically since then. Now I've been able to see firsthand how police today tackle the problem of internet predators. As my time with the Met continued, I was about to discover more about the other operations run by the paedophile unit and their links with other forces around the world that help them to catch a paedophile. These officers are at the sharp end of the battle to track down predators who want to groom children for sex. They're at the heart of the Metropolitan Police paedophile unit, the biggest unit of its kind in Britain and one of the biggest in the world. Its boss is Detective Chief Inspector Nick Stevens. We are responsible for the arrests of hundreds of paedophiles each year. We rescue, um, safeguard dozens of children each year. But these children are not just in London, they are across the UK and they are across the world because there are no boundaries when you're talking about tackling child abuse on the internet. Since 2005, the unit has been running covert internet operations with officers posing as teenage girls online to flush out predatory paedophiles. One of the profiles they have created is of a 13-year-old girl called Becky. Predators think she's like any other young teenager, into pop music and fashion. But in reality, they're having online chats with this man. John Taylor is a covert internet investigator, or CII. Talk me through, how does this grooming process work? I mean, what's the conversations that have? Again, it can we, you know, we have a, a thing in the office that how many questions will it be until they get round to sex? A lot of the, the first few abbreviations will be ASL, age, sex, location. So you'll confirm that I'm female, my name's Becky, I'm 13, I'm from London. What we will then do, the, the law enforcement side of our work is, well, what's your ASL? And a lot of the time they will tell us exactly where they are, their age. They may not give us their real name. The grooming will start then about your family life. Do you have a boyfriend? And then straight away it will get into something like, um, have you had sex yet? Do you enjoy sex? John told me how in one chat room he'd been contacted by someone calling himself Mike. If I bring up the, the chat log, you can just see here, I tell him that I'll be 14 in July and his response to that straight away is 13 years of age is a turn on. On his profile he says he's married but looking. He says he works in sales management. Worryingly he attaches a photo of himself naked. He lists his hobbies. They include open-minded women and girls. He says he's interested in kinky kids. After just one instant messaging conversation, he's told John, posing as a 13-year-old girl, 
that he wants to meet. You come down the chat log and it talks about the meet just here. He starts talking about where do you live? Is it London? Yeah, where are you? He said, tells me, I go to London on business. I tell him that I live in an area of London. And then he comes straight out. This is on the first chat. It's the first Yahoo Messenger chat. And there it is. I could meet you there if you wanted. Now suddenly we've gone through. We've got all these images that he has sent quite happily to a 13, 14 year old girl. His profile is of a naked male. He has sent me a picture of himself naked. Talks about sex. Would like to have sex with this 13 year old girl. And on the first Yahoo Messenger it's about I can meet you in London if you wanted. I mean, just picking up on some of those, the, the text there, if I strip for you, will you show me your breasts? Do you think you would just watch or do you want to touch? I mean, I, that's incredible. Here we have a 41-year-old man who is clearly open about what he wants to do to a 13, 14-year-old girl. Almost three months after receiving that first message from the man calling himself Mike, a meeting has been arranged. He expects to meet 13-year-old Becky. Instead, he will be confronted by Detective Inspector Dave Manning and his team. We've had officers in Bedfordshire at his home address. Uh, he's been seen to leave this morning and he's been driving a blue Audi A6. Uh, he said in one of the messages to our um, child that uh, he would um, look out for the big blue car. What do you know about him? He's, he's a married man. Not sure much else about him. He has no criminal record. Um, so uh, that's, that's all we know at the moment. We're not sure exactly what he does for a living. Um, we think he's some sort of tra he travels as part of his job. Um, it certainly appears that way, but um, until we actually get to deal with him, then you know, we won't know for sure. I know it's difficult to guess, but what would you expect his reaction to be? Well, it is difficult to guess, and different people, the reactions vary really, almost always, total shock, um, because he will realise that his world is probably going to collapse around him, you know, his job, his family, but, you know, he, he is a predatory paedophile, he's travelling to London from Cambridgeshire, you know, thinking he's going to have sex with a 13-year-old 13 13-year-old 13 girl. Internet predator Mike Baker thinks he's about to meet an underage girl for sex. Little does he know what awaits him. On a wet Tuesday morning in South London, detectives from the Metropolitan Police Paedophile Unit are in position, ready to make an arrest. A man calling himself Mike has arranged to meet what he thinks is a 13-year-old girl after grooming her online. DI Dave Manning gets in position near the street where the meeting is due to take place. Mike isn't due to turn up for another 25 minutes, but one of Dave's team has spotted a man who he thinks is a suspect. He's on foot, um, he's constantly on the phone, um, wandering about. He's got on a street quarter length black Volkswagen Beetle, and he's wearing a black jacket with a beige-brown, sort of fawn-coloured trousers, and it's quite smartly dressed. That was a description that was given to us this morning. Yeah, it's all safe, Callan. In the event that there are two or more officers in a position to stop him, please do so. He's just by the bus on the near side now. On the bus. Dave's team move in for an arrest. This is Mike Baker, a middle-aged businessman who expected to meet a 13-year-old girl for sex. Come this way, Mr. Baker. Okay, climb in the back. Sit this side, please. No, sit this side. I follow officers 
as they take him to Charing Cross Police Station. Um, so okay. we're um, in receipt of intelligence to um, suggest that this gentleman has travelled down to London today um, for the purposes of meeting um, a 13-year-old child with the intention of engaging in sexual activity with her following sexual grooming. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Every person brought into the police station is searched, okay? So an officer now is going to search you, okay? Right, just get your jacket off for me, please. Mm -hmm. Detectives have found what appear to be Viagra tablets and condoms in his pocket. After Baker is checked in, detectives begin questioning him about his conversations with Becky. Did you say, if I strip for you, will you show me your breasts? Well, I have no comment. On the 15th of May, um, you said, strictly speaking, you're underage, but you're very sexy. Did you say that? Uh, no comment. Is this the first time, and have we caught you and nip this in the bud? Uh, I will answer that question and say that this certainly is the first time. Um, and other than that, I've got no further comment to make on that. Have you ever attempted to meet another child and it's not gone through. No, I have no comment to make on that. So this is the first person that you've interacted with in this in these terms, is it? Uh, to reiterate my point, this is the first person that I've tried to meet. Right. So is it fair to say that you may have had, for want of a better word, some sexy chat with perhaps other underage yeah, no, girls? So I've got no comment to make on that. But that this is the time that you've actually crossed the line and travelled down to meet them? I think I've, I've said what I wanted to say in that respect. And uh, yeah, I've got no further comment to, to make on that. Okay. I know there's no one reason why offenders want to abuse children. I decided to get the opinion of Donald Finlater, who has worked with paedophiles for more than 20 years. There's a lot said that if you're an offender, you've been a victim of sexual abuse. What's your experience of that? Rather a lot of people who have offended have, yes, been sexually abused as children. Not all of them. And, of course, the majority of people who are sexually abused do not go on to become sex offenders. So it's not the, it's not the only explanation, but for some it's a contributory factor to them becoming a sex offender. Many of them have been exp exposed to domestic violence, parental alcoholism, maybe kind of neglect of various kinds. So there's d damaging things happened to most sex offenders when they were children that together have, have kind of formed them into the, into the people that have gone on to harm in their future lives. But that can never be an excuse. We can feel sad that those realities happen to them. Part of treatment is about facing them and actually not being held back by those damaging experiences. Meanwhile, I received a call from DI Dave Manning. He asked me to join him on an arrest, this time in West London. We're on our way to arrest a gentleman by the name of Robert Purcell, who uh, is currently en route, we believe, to um, Hammersmith to uh, meet what he believes is a 13 year old girl, Becky. Yes, yes, uh, in the direction of um, Obviously, In May, on 28th of May this year, he contacted Becky again, said he'd like to, to meet her, he'd like to take her virginity. Um, and yesterday, um, he's contacted us again and said he'd like to meet today if that was possible. Parcel's online chats with Becky were explicit from the beginning. In a series of online chats in the months that follow, Parcel keeps the conversation sexual. As the day of the meeting draws near, it's clear Parcel 
is aware of the risks he's taking. Three months after Parcel first approached Becky online, Dave Manning and his team are in place ready to arrest him. He's convinced Parcel is a real danger to children. He believes he's coming here to go with a 13-year-old girl back to her house and have sex with her. That's quite clear. That's what he intends to do and that's what he expects to happen. So, you know, it's important that we arrest these people as quickly as we can um, because you know, if, if we don't arrest him today, who's he going to talk to on the internet tonight? Who's going to talk to over the weekend? Who else is he going to try and groom? He may well be, have other people that he's planning on meeting tomorrow, for all, for all we know. Officers are in position and ready to arrest Parcel. He's parking in Charing Cross Hospital. OK. Passing, passing. Okay. The meeting is just minutes away. They're just on the approach now to uh, the rail and now very close to mine. And the subject is in front of a Yeah, Palin, that's uh, all received by the Armani. One of the team calls with an update. The suspect is almost at the meeting place. The information is relayed to two officers nearby. He's coming up to the roundabout now. He's in front of a silver Vauxhall Vivaro van. He's just approaching the roundabout. Subject has gone straight down, yeah. straight Caroline Street. Yeah, like Any minute now. Don't, don't pull it, don't cry yet. Yeah. Put the camera down. It's not going left, put the camera down. Parcel has driven straight past us. Thank you, we got him. We got him. Yeah. Yeah. Just slowly, just ask him. We can see his black Nissan Sunny in our wing mirror, being boxed in by the police's silver people carrier. Okay, let's go. Right, police officers. What's up? Police officers, put your phone down. Don't listen car, to what this woman's going to say to you. Come out the car. Put your hands up. What's your name, please? Uh, Robert Parcell. Robert Parcell. My name's DC Fleury. I'm from the Metropolitan Police Pedophile Unit. Why are you here today, please, Robert? I'm not. I'm... What, what, why have you come to the street today? To see someone. Who you come to see? Um, a girl. Okay. Robert, because of that, I'm arresting you now for attempting to meet a child following sexual grooming. And in reply to that, you don't have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you do not mention when questioned. Something which you later on in court, anything you do say will be given in evidence, do you understand? OK. Thanks, Dave. This is Robert Parcell, a security worker who travelled to London from Sussex on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> hoping to meet a 13-year-old girl for sex. I follow officers to Charing Cross Police Station to see Parcel waiting to be booked in. He looks a forlorn figure. Peter, oh, right, okay. I know one of us has found you up there. Yeah, yeah. Just let you know, downstairs. Later, back in the office, I wanted to find out what he had to say during interview. Nick, bring me up to speed on Robert Parcell. What happened in the interview? Parcell was interviewed. Um, he he admitted that yes, he had been the the individual who'd been communicating with us. Um, yes, he travelled uh, thinking he was um, coming to meet, he said, a teenager. Um, and he, he put the defence up that he travelled to meet in order to warn the child not to meet strangers on the internet, which um, obviously beggars belief a little bit. But um, that's what he, uh, he chose to speak to us about in interview. He's saying in interview... I was meeting and I was going to warn her, you know, almost like a moral crusader. Absolutely. I mean, is this a defence that they use? It seems to me to be ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, the, the two main defences, I think, would be fair to say is that, one, um, I was turning up to warn her against strangers and meeting people on the internet, and secondly, that uh, I never believed she was under 16 years of age. This is why it's so important um, for our investigators to make it very clear, both on the profile and during conversation, hey, look, you are talking to an 11-year-old, a 12-year-old, a 13-year-old child. Good. 
but as the painstaking work of strengthening the case against Parcel continued, I heard about the success of a separate operation involving members of the team. The British paedophile, nicknamed the Librarian, who collected a quarter of a million child abuse images, was sent to jail indefinitely today. Philip Thompson was part of an international paedophile ring that reached into 33 countries. He thought he Undercover officers from the unit succeeded in infiltrating an international paedophile ring. And as a result, this man, Philip Thompson, has been convicted. One of the cases you dealt with is Philip Thompson. Um, and that started with your team, didn't it? Yeah, Philip Thompson was basically a, a member of an international network, a leader of an international network who controlled a number of websites, forums, which the only reason you would go onto that website or join that network was if you had a sexual interest in children. We deployed undercover officers onto that website and over a number of months we were able to infiltrate that website. Did that very, very successfully, so much so we became very, very trusted by the moderators of the site, by Philip Thompson, that, en that enabled us to identify everybody who was a member of that site, all the key members of the network, and it wasn't just in relation to people looking at images or sharing images. The higher end of the network were engaged in hands-on abuse themselves and were sharing images of children that they were abusing. Thompson was jailed indefinitely. More than 50 other arrests were made as a result of the same operation. In November 2007, as part of a separate job, police launched Operation Edgemead. Covert officers took over the email account of a convicted paedophile. They wanted to find out what other paedophiles they could meet on the internet. Dave Manning told me more. How successful is it when your undercover officers go online and pose as offenders? Oh, high, highly successful. We've had a number of investigations of, of this type. Um, Operation Edge Me, we've um, you know, arrested a significant number of people. About 12 people have been arrested as a result of Operation Edge Me. And dozens of others have been disseminated to other forces. That's just the sort of people in and around London. Um, dozens more have been, have been disseminated to other forces for them to deal with. The covert officers told paedophiles who contacted them on the web that they had a 12-year-old daughter called Katie, who they would allow to be abused. One of the men who contacted them was Simon Foster. He uh, started interacting with us last year, um, very early on, was very uh, sexually explicit about what he wanted to do to our daughter, Katie. Um, that developed and eventually he met, we deployed an undercover officer as the paedophile and Simon Foster met that person and they had a long conversation which was you know, explicit, very graphic around the, the sexual acts that he wanted to perform on, on his daughter. Now what type of things, I appreciate it's very graphic some of it, what types of things did he want to do? What was he talking about? Uh, they had long conversations about it. Katie was a virgin, he wanted to um, take her virginity, um, he described various sexual acts he wanted to perform on her, including oral sex and uh, other, you know, really quite graphic and disgusting sort of conversations that he was having with them. But what kind of man would even discuss abusing a child in such a horrendous way? I was about to discover for myself when I joined Dave Manning as he headed out of London to arrest Simon Foster. On a cold, wet morning, this predator is about to discover the man he met four months ago to discuss abusing a little girl. Wasn't another paedophile, but an undercover officer. It's early morning and D.I. Dave Manning and his team are on their way to arrest a man who's been speaking to what he thinks is another paedophile online. He's even had a meeting with an undercover officer and told him he wants to abuse a 12-year-old girl called Katie. But Katie doesn't exist. 
and Simon Foster is about to discover he's at the centre of a police sting operation. Police officer. Hello, Mr. Foster. Yeah. I was shocked to discover that the man who wanted to abuse 12 year old Katie was in fact a married family man. Today what we've seen is what we see on many of our jobs is the total devastation that this kind of activity causes to, it's not just about you know, the person that's been arrested and clearly we're here to protect children but the, the fallout for, for the, the people arrested and their immediate families is absolutely immense. Nobody enjoys going into someone's house and delivering this, this kind of news to them but um, yeah, we have to bear in mind that in the long term you know, we are our aim, we are protecting children mm -hmm. and uh, I think that always has to be at the forefront of our mind and, and we have, just have to get over these issues. Dave's team take away six computers, various DVDs and mobile phone equipment. Finally, after four hours, Foster is led out. Later that day, Foster was interviewed by a female detective. He admitted wanting to abuse 12-year-old Katie and spoke openly about his meeting with the undercover officer he knew as Graham. So what drove you to actually go and meet Graham though? I mean at that stage were you considering it as uh, as a genuine possibility? I suppose I must have been, yes. Hmm. Um, but whether I was thinking, well obviously I wasn't thinking clearly, I was being led by my libido or whatever. Um, yes, I suppose to a degree I must have been thinking that it was a, a possibility of something happening. If I'd had the spare time or the opportunity, who knows? Simon Foster later admitted attempting to arrange the commission of a child sex offence. He also admitted making and distributing indecent images of children. He was sentenced to 21 months in jail and will be on the sex offenders register indefinitely. Part of the work of detectives dealing with paedophiles revolves around suicide prevention, putting offenders in touch with support organisations following their arrest. But I wonder what impact working on these cases has on the officers themselves. I mean, it's, it's difficult. I think two things have struck me since I've come to this unit. And obviously I was aware of the existence of paedophiles, but I, I had no idea that there were so many right. and that they, you know, some of the, the levels of depravity are just really quite shocking, you know, very, very shocking indeed. About six weeks ago, I saw a clip of a... Um, a paedophile movie, if you like, indecent, it was a, a, a rape of a small baby and it really, you know, I felt sick, you know, absolutely physically sick about it and I think some people, you know, any, anyone else would, looking at that would, would view it in exactly the same way. They're absolutely horrific images at times that we have to deal with. How do you deal with that? How do you personally deal with seeing horrible pictures of children who are being abused? Um, I don't know is the answer really. I don't know how I do. I think that this type of work, I think if you if you if you couldn't deal with it, you'd very very quickly realise that, and would say, look, I'm not, you know, I don't think I can deal with this, you know, and, and that has happened in the past, you know. Both myself and the detective sergeants will, you know, monitor the officers. Um, they are reg they receive regular psychological assessment to make sure that the work isn't sort of having an adverse impact upon them. Certainly, something that struck me in making this program is the sheer scale and size of the problem. Do you think that you and your team can do more? Yes, I think we could. Um, you know, if I if I um, if I was given twice the number of officers, I could do twice the amount of work. You know, there's no there's no shortage of work out there at all. Believe me. For Dave Manning and his team, another way of tracking down offenders is to follow the money. The credit cards used by paedophiles to download indecent images of children. Back in the unit, detectives had discovered a database with the details of thousands of people who'd accessed sites selling images. 
Meiosis, as it's called, is one of the unit's biggest ever operations. DS Nick Duffield asked me to meet him in West London before dawn, as he prepared to arrest a man called Grant Jivers. His credit card details had been found on the database. It seems Mr Chivers is on a night shift, or was on a night shift last night. He's due back at 8 o'clock in about an hour's time. We are executing the search warrant at the moment. There is property to recover, um, and then we will obviously make arrangements either to arrest Mr Chivers um, on his return, or we'll arrange for him to come into the police station. Finally, an hour later, Chivers returns home. I learn Nick Duffield has seized a laptop and computer disks during his search. Minutes later, I watch as Chivers is taken away for further questioning. But I wanted to learn more about this sickening trade in indecent images of children. Head of the unit, Nick Stevens, and his boss, Detective Superintendent Sue Knight, invited me to join them on a trip to Interpol headquarters in Lyon, France. They had come to update criminal intelligence officer Mick Moran on the arrests made as a result of Operation Meiosis. So far to date, Mick, um, within the London area, we've uh, arrested 70 people. In the UK, it's over 300 people at the present time had some really significant results uh, certainly one result in the Midlands the offender was arrested and led to the identification of 14 children who had been raped and that individual has now been uh, convicted of 14 rapes of children that's that's a staggering uh, uh, and the, the issue fact, for me the, really. the offender was very young uh, himself and um, uh, under 25 and how long would it be before any of those children would have come forward? Or how many more children would he have abused before he'd have come to know My God, 14 children. That's a massive capture. And it just goes to show what this is all about. That Operation Meiosis is not just lines of text or people looking at pictures. This is about, you know, abusing children at the end of the day. That's what, that's what, that's what the, the images are and that's what these guys are after. Um, With the help of the Met, Interpol are on the trail of a criminal gang behind the websites a gang earning millions from men prepared to pay around £60 a time to access sickening images of children being abused. In, in 14 months you have 65,000 people in the world mm. willing to pay organised criminals for access to this sort of material. That's mm. madness. Mm. You know, it really mm. is scary. What I find really scary, and I'm sure many members of the public would find scary, is that we think of organised crime being around drugs, being around money laundering. But what you're saying is actually organised crime now is very much involved in the manufacture, the making of indecent images and ultimately the abuse of children. That's right. And this is, and this is an example of that an example of how they are getting involved and they are seeing the children as a product they are seeing the child abuse imagery as a product mm -hmm. and the great thing about the meiosis job is that it plugs in to the other investigations and it plugs in with with the excellent evidence that was gathered as mm -hmm. part of meiosis and it allows other countries to action a little bit better this organized crime gang my trip to interpol had impressed on me how vulnerable children now are to organized crime gangs around the world I learned Operation Meiosis arrests are likely to continue for months, if not years. Meanwhile, back in London, the covert internet operations are ongoing. Pedophiles are prepared to take their time to wait um, to achieve their objectives. DS Nick Duffield asked me to join him. A man was travelling to London from his home in Essex to meet what he thought was a 14-year-old girl. The situation this morning is the man Ian Price has been communicating um, with what he believes to be a 14 year old girl since May this year. The uh, interaction has been extremely sexual and on a number of occasions he's asked, uh, he's asked this girl to come and meet him for sex. Um, a day's been fixed today, pre-arranged location to meet and he expects to meet the girl and take her back to his house for sex. In early conversations with what he thought was a 14 year old girl, Price asks if he can be her boyfriend.
Just days later, in another online conversation, he insists she's not too young to be his girlfriend. Three weeks after first chatting to Shelley online, Price is keen to meet. As the meeting draws near, he asks Shelley to send him a picture of herself topless. Thanks. Bye. What's the update? Um, he's, um, Price has been communicating with us, telling us how excited he is about um, meeting us this morning, how much he's looking forward to it. We've managed to establish that um, what he's wearing this morning, he's wearing a black shirt and grey jogging bottoms, white trainers. Um, and he's also confirmed that he is en route to the pre-arranged location and that he'll be on time to meet us at uh, around quarter to ten. We are aware that this individual's got previous um, convictions for violence, um, so all the officers have been briefed appropriately in relation to that. Um, beyond that, we'll deal with whatever situation arises. Soon we arrive at the tube station where Price is expecting to meet Shelley. Members of Nick Duffield's undercover team are already in place. Price is expected to arrive in a matter of minutes. Five in the morning and Nick Duffield and his undercover team from the Metropolitan Police paedophile unit are in position at a London tube station. Concerned about Ian Price's previous conviction for assault, Nick asks us to hang back. Which one? Grab him, grab him for us when you see him. Yeah. Minutes later, a man fitting Price's description is spotted coming up the escalator. Listen, DC Bartle from the paedophile unit. Yeah, okay. What's your name? Ian. Ian what? Any keys. Right. Ian, what are you here for? Rather than the 14-year-old girl he'd been planning to take home for sex, he is met by officers from the paedophile unit. I'm arresting you for travelling to meet a child following sexual grooming. Yeah, You're taking a child to commit sexual acts and causing a child to view sexual acts. Just turn towards me. DS Nick Duffield carries out an initial body search, checking for any evidence. A packet of chewing gum. One lighter. A watch. Price is later booked in at Charing Cross Police Station as members of Nick Duffield's team head to his home to seize his computers. And the tube maps in there as well. OK, that's right. A short while later, Price is interviewed by Detective Constable Caroline Bartle. Um, and on that day, did you say, so you thought any more about being my girl then, Shelley? Okay. She challenges him on the conversations he had online with what he thought was a 14-year-old girl. Uh, and do you like to be held and touched and caressed and played with? No comment. 
on the same day did you say, I wish we could be together right now, babe. Would love to have you in my arms, holding you tight, caressing you and kissing you passionately. Okay. And do you like being kissed around your neck and ears? And it's okay, babe, don't worry, I understand. I like that you're a virgin, sweetheart. I could show you and teach you things in bed if you want me to. Nothing. That's what you wanted to do with her, isn't it? Okay. Did you say, I really do love you so very much, Shelley. You're my everything, my one true love. Okay. What are you doing by saying, trying, trying to do by saying stuff like that to okay. Trying to make her feel good? No. Grooming her? No, Can you see that? No, Is that a photograph of your penis? No, Did you send it to Shelley? No, no, no. Later, I catch up with Nick Duffield's colleague, Jason Tun, who is now overseeing the case. Jason, Ian Price was at court this morning. What's the latest? The court have considered in, in all the circumstances to grant him bail, which obviously we're quite disappointed in. Um, but there have been conditions that have been placed upon him. Uh, the c conditions are that he uh, has a curfew uh, overnight, that he's not allowed to take uh, or have any access to the internet. And how do you police that? How do you make sure he doesn't have access to the internet, for example? Well, it's very difficult. Um, you know, we, we take people's computers away. But, um, uh, as everyone knows, there's internet cafes all over the place. Virtually everybody in the country, I would suggest, has access to a computer, either personally through a friend or through an internet cafe. Uh, it's a very difficult thing for us to police, to be honest. Months later, I was to discover confiscating Ian Price's computer wasn't enough to stop his offending. No, no, we don't. We're separate. While he was waiting for his case to go to court, 47-year-old Price had a real 14-year-old girl in his sights. He had pretended to be a 21-year-old man and begun texting and phoning her, trying to groom her for sex. The girl, who we'll call Sarah, agreed to speak to me. What type of things would he say in the text? Um, that he'd fell in love with me, uh, that he wanted me to meet him. One of them was he wanted me to go round there once I'd got drunk with my friends and he was like just telling me he loved me and that I had a really nice voice. But after a month, the conversations turned sexual. He was laying in a hotel room, screaming my name and stuff like that, and I was on the other end of the phone. And I just sat there, and I tried not to listen. And it was just like in my ear, and I wanted to get off the phone. And no, I couldn't, I was too scared, so I carried on listening to what he was doing. And he was like, I'll play with yourself, and um, I'll get you a toy if you want. And I was like, no, you're all right, thanks. And uh, we finished that conversation and the next day he texted me. And in the mornings it'd be like, oh, I'm sitting here waiting for you. I was talking to him in the morning about seven o'clock when I was on my way to school or leaving mine. We were texting all through the day. I was talking to him when I got home from school, before I went to bed. It was just like he was doing it step by step and it was all where he's reeling me in. Like I was on the end of a fishing line and he was gradually pulling me in, step by step. Sarah finally plucked up the courage to tell her parents about Price. They contacted the police. At court, Price had admitted the offences relating to the police sting operation, but denied the offence relating to Sarah. It meant she had to give evidence. Finally, a jury found him guilty of inciting a child to engage in sexual activity. Jobless Price was jailed indefinitely and won't be eligible for parole for two years. He will remain on the sex offenders register indefinitely. Meanwhile, I learned that the other offenders featured in tonight's programme were also given jail sentences. Remember Mike Baker, the
the married man who posted a photo of himself naked on the internet. He admitted attempting to meet a child following sexual grooming. Baker was given an 18-month prison sentence and will be on the sex offenders register for 10 years. Baker is now divorced. Grant Chivers, the man whose credit card details appeared on the Operation Meiosis database, pleaded guilty to possessing and making indecent images of children. He was sentenced to 15 months imprisonment and will be on the sex offenders register for 10 years. Meanwhile, I learned one of the other paedophiles featured in tonight's program had walked free from court. Robert Parcell, the man who wanted to take a 13-year-old girl's virginity, admitted attempting to meet a child following sexual grooming and inciting a child to engage in sexual activity. The judge gave him a 12-month prison sentence but it was suspended on the condition he completes a sex offender's treatment program. Parcel will be on the sex offender's register for 10 years. Whilst most child abuse happens at the hands of family or friends, I believe the dangers posed by paedophiles on the net cannot be underestimated. The paedophile unit have charged or cautioned more than 300 predators since their covert internet operations began in 2005. Most of the offenders have no previous conviction. How long might they have enjoyed the anonymity of the internet and put real children at risk were it not for this pioneering police work? And that's what's at the heart of the sting operations, saving real children from predators. The success of these operations means they're now being rolled out to other forces, not just in Britain, but around the world. But one thing is clear to me, it's down to us as parents to do all we can to keep our children safe. These paedophiles were put behind bars, but how many more men like them are waiting to speak to our children the next time they go online?